What's your take on the potential of longevity benefits of high dose vitamin D versus the risk of hypercalcinemia? So I'm going to suggest we just go back and forth. Brian takes first on one and then I'll take first on the next one. So this is your turn to go first. <laughs> I, I, I don't think anybody should be talking about any vitamin unless they're measuring their vitamin levels. Mm. Uh, because uh, if you're taking excessive amounts of vitamins that can cause harmful effects, hypercalcinemia is one of them for vitamin D. I, I think that uh, a lot of people are taking multivitamins or start, you know, taking tons of particular vitamins. Uh, I'll just say this, if we optimize vitamin D levels in mice, we can um, protect against frailty onset with age. Uh, and I think that, I suspect if you really tried a program of optimizing vitamin levels, and I know we can argue about what's optimal, yeah. but, but the, if we tried to optimize that in individuals, well, I think we would affect aging in, in the human population significantly. I think the problem is that the companies that sell vitamins don't want to do that. <laughs> Uh, because they don't want to be measuring people all the time and collecting blood. And it's not doing just the essays. companies; it's the primary care or medical system. Yeah, as well. I agree. Most, I, most people in the U.S. don't get their vitamin D measured. On I know, or any basis. vitamin. You know, yeah. and so I, this is crazy. We should be measuring these things uh, and taking a personalized strategy to optimize them in individuals, bringing them back every three to six months and measuring them again. And I, I tell longevity clinics all the time: you know, you can go to exotic longevity interventions, and that's great, but. <laughs> Man, there's a lot to be gained from just optimizing the vitamin levels yeah. and other micronutrients. Yeah. So I would agree, just would add, some vitamins are harder to measure than others. Yeah. You know, some like vitamin D will give you a picture of what your vitamin D levels have been over the last few months. Vitamin C, it'll depend on whether you took a vitamin C supplement that morning. Yeah. So it's not it's not easy to measure everything, yeah. but there are other biomarkers you can use yeah. to assess the vitamin um, levels. The other thing I'll just mention as well is I think, you know, this idea of high dose, low dose, this gets to what Brian was saying. Like we need to have a conversation around what do we mean by optimum? Um, some people would consider, you know, moving people into what I think of as the optimum vitamin D level as a high dose. I think what we're referring to here are doses that go beyond that. Yeah. And so we just have to be clear what we mean when we're talking about high dose yeah. versus low dose. You guys know your levels? Yes. Uh, it's up three months ago. I did. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I would love to know your opinion on omega-3. I love omega-3. Yeah, <laughs> huge fan. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, again, I think this, this is much like vitamin D, right? <laughs> Where we can measure it. We have very accurate ways to measure it. What you measure in blood is a reflection of your omega-3 uh, levels over a period of weeks to months. So I think we should measure intervene if you are outside the optimal range and measure again and try to keep people within the optimal range. I, I do think, so there is a question again about what is optimal, right? My view is that the epidemiology in general supports the idea that um, Americans by and large almost uniformly are suboptimal for omega-3. I think most people could benefit from increasing their omega-3 levels. Is it better to increase omega-3 through diet as opposed to supplements? Probably. Can most people achieve optimal levels of omega-3 through diet in the United States? Is that realistic? Probably not. So then this question of are omega-3 supplements, do they have any value at all or could they potentially be harmful? The data I've seen where people try to scare the public into thinking they're harmful is just bullshit in my view. I think that it's just people trying to get headlines. I don't believe that there is any real data that for the typical person, omega-3 supplements have any significant risk. Do omega-3 supplements have benefits? I think the, the again, it's hard to know with 100% certainty. I think the data we've got available now suggests, yeah, they probably can have benefits if you're deficient and you supplement into the optimal range. And I think that's, you know, the meta-analysis studies that you see out there with vitamins and omega-3 and all these things, that's what they're deficient in. We don't know how many people we took from outside the the optimal range into into the optimal range right. and how many people that were in the optimal range and we took them out of the optimal range. And until we measure things on that level, we're not going to see the benefits of these things. You're talking about where, where some of these studies say, you know, we look at people who supplemented with vitamin D yeah, omega-3 yeah, versus yeah. people who didn't. Yeah. And you're right. They never measure yeah. the actual amounts that the yeah. people in the studies achieved or yeah. had before they started supplementing. Yes. Yeah. Clearly poor science, and yet it somehow 
you know, makes well, it. Well, but it's again literature. reflective of the fact that these things are sold as natural supplements, and I get it. Companies like that have to sell it on the cheap. They can't charge a fortune for these things, yeah. and they don't have the resources or ability to measure the bloodstream of everybody that's taking the product. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not really blaming the companies, but I think the system is set up wrong. We need to be taking a more proactive role in people's health, and these are things we should be measuring yeah. somehow. Yeah, and I would just add, you know, there are people who will say, you know, the correlations that show that people who are below optimal for vitamin D and omega-3, there's a whole bunch of bad stuff, like really, really bad stuff that's correlated with being deficient for vitamin D and omega-3. And there are some people out there who's like, well, correlation is not causation. And they're right, correlation is not causation, except in both of those cases, there are very biologically plausible mechanisms yeah. connecting the problems with the deficiency. So yeah. it's true. Nobody has done a clinical trial where we're going to make you deficient in vitamin D and show that bad stuff happens to you, but we can be pretty sure that there is a causal relationship. That'd be in those cool cases. though. Can we do that? <laughs> <laughs> that would be hard to get through the human subjects <laughs> approval process. Uh, there's, there's jurisdictions. <laughs> Are wearable devices like Whoop or Aura actually effective in providing actionable insights for longevity-focused individuals? I think it depends on the, the person. I'm certainly uh, these wearable or trackable devices can provide actionable insights. So like with Aura Ring in particular, my personal experience was, um, and I slept pretty well, I, and I, this isn't going to surprise anybody, but you know, my personal experience, this was back when I was drinking, um, uh, was that even if I had one drink, my sleep quality was trashed. And so I, that's an actionable thing, right? Um, so yeah, I think some, for many people it is. I think for some people they can create anxiety. And so that, you know, is something to consider if you're using these trackables. I think they're great. I wear a Garmin watch. I, I use it for measuring my bio, bio uh, changes when I'm running, you know, to, uh, things like that. Uh, I also have an aura ring. I don't wear it all the time, but I, I think it's really good for sleep. I'm not sure it's better for any, any of the other things. Yeah. Um, the, uh, and I think if the more people can be informed about their own bodies, the more likely they are to take action. So I think in general, they're very good. And I just shouldn't point out this. Yeah. CGM. CGM. Uh, everyone I think should wear that because you learn a lot about how your body reacts to what you eat and what you drink. And, um, People react differently to different things, and you know it's it's kind of a cool toy that informs people at the same time. I think they're important for clinics, not so much by what it tells the clinic, but what it tells the individual mm -hmm. is how much they learn. An example of that is that I have people coming to me all the time and say, "Wow, I don't understand. You know, I'm exercising to lose weight, but when I run, my glucose goes up." I'm like, "Now you're learning physiology." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. The only thing I would add about the the CGM, first of all. I don't think you need to wear it all the time. I know no, that's not what you no, meant, no, no. but but pe some people may have heard that. And so I think once in a while yeah, is really agree. helpful. And I think it's important with CGM in particular that it's done in the context of an educational program around what it yeah. means. And the only reason I say that is there are some of these direct to consumer facing companies that don't give us solid foundation in what the CGM is telling yeah. you or give misinformation. And again, I think that can create anxiety for people when it's not coupled with appropriate yep. educational content. Mm -hmm.